Uh, welcome to the Carnegie Endowment uh, and welcome to our event on previewing Egypt's upcoming elections. I'm Michelle Dunn. I'm a scholar in the Middle East program here at Carnegie. And we have today two uh, exceptional speakers. We have my colleague from our Carnegie Middle East Center in Beirut, Dr. Amr Hamzawi. And we have uh, another, uh, uh, another colleague of mine, Jeremy Sharp from the Congressional Research Service. These are two people who are extremely uh, well informed about what is going on in Egypt. And I think we're going to have a fascinating discussion today. Before we begin, I want to make one more introduction, which is that uh, as of today, Carnegie has a visiting scholar from the Middle East for the summer. If you would stand up, please. It's uh, This is Tagrid al Khodari. She uh, has been the New York Times correspondent in Gaza, uh, low these many years, and has agreed to come out and spend a few months at Carnegie, so she will be here in the Middle East program working on on Palestinian affairs, and we're, we're very delighted to have her with us, uh, and we're doing that in partnership with the Heinrich Böll Foundation. So uh, now back to today's events. Uh, we are going to uh, be talking about this very interesting political season in Egypt that we see beginning now and going over the next few months. I'm sorry, over the next more, more than a year, many months, not few months. Uh, and as I said, our two speakers, our main speaker is Dr. Amr Hamzawi, my colleague at the Carnegie Middle East Center. He's a noted Egyptian political scientist. He's on the faculty at Cairo University and formerly of the Free University in Berlin. He's a regular columnist in uh, Ashurugh newspaper in Egypt and a frequent participant in uh, media debates in Egypt and elsewhere in the Arab world. And he's going to share with us his insights of what is going on in Egypt now. And then we're going to have as discussant Jeremy Sharp from the Congressional Research Service. Uh, Jeremy is very much an expert on Egypt and on US policy toward the region. He's the author of several congressional reports on US relations with Egypt and with other uh, Arab countries, as well as US foreign aid to the Middle East. And uh, Jeremy will be speaking in his personal capacity and not as a representative of CRS or, or the US government today. OK, so uh, we're going to get started now. Um, it's, it's very interesting. As Amr and I were chatting informally this morning, we were kind of comparing the political scene in Egypt to na now to what was going on in at this time in 2005, five years ago when Egypt last held elections. Uh, presidential and parliamentary elections were held in the same year in 2005. This year we have parliamentary elections this year and a presidential election next year or uh, possibly before that should the succession happen, happen before that. Um, and I think it's very interesting to kind of contrast this. Once again, we see in Egypt kind of an, an opposition uh, we see the opposition becoming a bit enlivened uh, in the period leading up to elections. And um, so Amr's going to share with us his thoughts about that. You're going to speak for about 20 minutes, Amr, right? And then we'll have comments from Jeremy. And then we're going to leave lots of time for your questions and discussion. OK. Thank you very much, Michelle. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. In a way, it's a pleasure to be back. Let me, um, let me start by... Um, by basically building on uh, what Michel uh, just said, um, comparing uh, Egyptian politics 2010, probably 2011, to what, what the situation was in 2004 and 2000, 2005. There are some similarities which, uh, which we need to, uh, to be aware of. Uh, in 2004 and 2005, um, the Egyptian opposition spectrum primarily informal opposition networks not conventional political parties. We're getting active lobbying basically on two sets of demands. A, constitutional amendments, and B, um, in relation to the presidential succession, uh, lobbying against President Mubarak's uh, fifth term or the possibility, even in 2005, possibility of uh, President Mubarak's son, Gamal Mubarak, taking over. If you 
compare the platform of informal opposition 2004 and 2005 to the current platform uh, of uh, the National Association or Movement for Change uh, formed by uh, Muhammad al-Baradi and by different informal political actors and groups, be it the Muslim Brotherhood or otherwise, the platform is quite similar. In fact, the platform in 2010, probably in 2011, is structured around the two sets of demands, constitutional amendments and uh, issues related to the presidential succession. Um, as of now, the Egyptian opposition is pushing for a change of Article 76, 77, 88 of the Constitution. I'm going to, to go back to, to those articles and what they say. And they are lobbying against uh, a, a new term, a six, uh, if possible, for, uh, if, it go, if it's going to happen, of President Mubarak and uh, against a succession by President Mubarak's son, uh, Gamal Mubarak. So we have uh, a similarity in terms of platform. And in a way, this means that not much has changed in Egypt between 2004 and 2005 and 2010, 2011. Second point, the composition of the opposition spectrum which we are looking at is very similar uh, to 2004 and 2005. In 2004 and 2005, the dynamism of the opposition was headed by informal networks. Kifaya was a big name in 2004 and 2005, and primarily um, uh, activists of different generations that seemed to be able to cross the ideological divide between Islamist and non-Islamist opposition. In 2010 and 2011, we are still looking very much at the same composition. We have a replacement. Kifaya is now not the leading uh, actor. Kifaya has become a part, a component of the national movement for change headed by Dr. al-Baradi, but the movement itself, the national movement of al-Baradi, is very much structured around the same principle of loose, alliance, cross-ideological lobbying around the platform. Um, the third similarity between 2004, 2005, and 2010, 2011, is the fact that while, while the opposition is putting forward, or did put forward in 04 and uh, 05, or is putting forward in 2010, 2011, a platform, uh, a maximalist platform calling for constitutional amendments, for a full democratization of Egypt, and putting that platform forward, the opposition was not able in 04 and 05, and is still not able in 2010, 2011, to translate that platform into a set of concrete actions, an action plan of sorts. Up until now, we do not know whether the movement centered around Dr. Baradi will be able to or is interested in fielding candidates in the parliamentary elections, Shura Council elections and People's Assembly elections, upper chamber and lower chamber of the Egyptian parliament in 2010. What are they going to do if the government continues to boycott and reject the demands to amend the constitution to allow for independence, such as uh, Dr. Baradi Turan? Uh, on the presidential ballot in 2011. We do not know how they are trying to, help the government, um, uh, to hold the government accountable. So we have a maximalist platform calling for constitutional amendments, uh, addressing the issue of the presidency, and it's not being translated into a concrete set of actions. This was the case in 04 and 05, and this is the case in 2010 and 2000, 2011. There is one central difference between, uh, and one, one significant difference between 04, 05, and 2010, 2011, and this is the uh, uh, Baradi factor, I would say. In, in 2004 and 2005, the opposition did not have uh, a candidate, a candidate uh, around, uh, around whom everyone uh, rallied and mobilized and identified the movement, the drive for change with that person. Now, it is, it is a different situation. In 04 and 05, we had Kifaya, we had a bit of Ayman Noor, we had a bit of Al-Wavd, Zna'man, uh, Goma, but this, no one of them was a unified opposition candidate. As of now, Al Baradi represents uh, an, uh, the, the clear and, and, and uh, accepted opposition candidate, and he brings in uh, assets internationally and domestically that need to be looked at. He brings in internationally the asset of being a recognized uh, personality. Uh, domestically, he is not uh, a corrupt politician. And as you know, Egyptian politics, Egyptian uh, political space has never been an innocent space, and, and in a way, opposition and government uh, activists, politicians, um, have been, uh, have been um, uh, implicated in different corruption allegations. I'm referring to Ayman Noor's, to the allegations which was fielded by the regime against Ayman Noor approaching the elections of 2005 and right after it. Dr. Barada is different. He has not been part of the domestic game. He cannot be accused of being uh, corrupt. So he brings in international recognition. He brings in uh, 
fresh energy uh, and being away from, from, from the corrupt domestic political space uh, which we are looking at, there is one deficit which the government is trying to highlight in relation to Bari, namely the fact that he has been out of the country for a long time. But he has been managing that quite well. Uh, we can get into that later. But sort of the, we have a couple of similarities and we have a, a, an interesting difference related to Dr. El Baradi's role. Um, let, me, let me remind you uh, as well of the fact that uh, a year ago, or less than a year ago, Egyptian politics, Egyptian political dynamics did not appear to be as interesting as they are as of now. I mean, if you recall our earlier discussions and even papers which were produced here at Carnegie and elsewhere, looking at Egyptian politics um, uh, post-2005, and after the regime managed to uh, contain sort of the big injection of um, the Muslim Brotherhood's role in parliament with the 88 seats they have, Egyptian politics, Egyptian political dynamics were looked at as being in a stalemate, sort of stagnant of sorts. Former politics in Egypt was being described as a stagnant space. If you compare what we, what we used to say, what we used to, to write and say about Egyptian politics a year ago with what is happening right now, you see a big difference. Uh, it's once again becoming more, more dynamic and it's, it's creating and generating more interest domestically and internationally. So it's, and, and, that is not only related to the political calendar and the fact that we are, as Michel mentioned, we are well into a political calendar that is uh, quite intense, but once again, the fact that al Baradi and his role has re-energized public, intellectual, and political debates in, in Egypt. Now, let me, let me um, basically, in, 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 in a couple of minutes, try to review uh, the legal and constitutional environment uh, based on which the parliamentary elections, Shura Council elections, People Assembly uh, elections, as well as the presidential elections are going to take, uh, take place. Let me start by Article 88 of the Egyptian Constitution, which was amended in 2007 and which basically removed judicial supervision. Uh, of elections. And this is a key component to look at when we look at the constitution and legal environment. Egyptian elections in 2010 and 2011 will not be supervised, will not be supervised by the judiciary. And this has been the case or was the case in Egypt throughout the 1990s and up until the elections of 2005, parliamentary and presidential. Second interesting um, uh, component uh, or feature of the legal environment is the fact that the state of emergency, emergency laws still exist and are going to be renewed. There are increased signs recently that the government is going to introduce uh, the renewal of the uh, emergency law very soon to the People's Assembly. President Mubarak in his only uh, uh, speech address to Egyptians since um, his uh, operation and uh, his sick leave uh, a couple of weeks ago, the only address, uh, which was uh, uh, a few days ago, he addressed the issue of uh, terrorism, the fact that Egypt still needs um, uh, a way to tackle the challenge of terrorism, which was interpreted, and Gamal Mubarak uh, sec um, uh, came a couple of days later and did agree and went in the same direction. There are signs that the emergency law is going, the state of emergency is going to be renewed very soon. And the state of emergency means approaching the elections, basically two sets of restrictions. One, that political actors, political parties, formal, informal, conventional, less conventional networks or parties cannot rally. They, can, they, cannot, they cannot organize a rally anywhere. Um, uh, you can, the security apparatus can arrest them, the security apparatus can harass opposition uh, activists. In fact, today, a few hours ago, there was an attempted march by different MPs members of parliaments, as well as opposition uh, candidates, to address uh, the demand to change, to amend the constitution to the Speaker of the People's Assembly, Dr. Fatih Sroor, and the march was uh, hindered by the security apparatus, by the security forces. So as long as we have the state of emergency, it's very difficult for any opposition actor to rally and mobilize. Secondly, um, the state of emergency means that um, uh, opposition activists, politicians, leaders can be easily harassed. Of course, the Muslim Brotherhood has been the prime target of the regime, but this can be extended to any set of opposition actors, and we have been seeing some of that in the last weeks in relation to Dr. Baradi's uh, National Movement for Change, arrest of some of the activists uh, on April 6, 2010. Third feature of the legal and constitutional environment which we are looking at is the fact that the restrictions and limitations on forming political parties continue to exist, continue to exist. Not much uh, has happened. 
Fourth feature, and here I move from <coughs> parliamentary elections to presidential elections, Article 76. As you know, Article 76, which was amended twice in 2005 and 2007, in its current, um, uh, in its current um, uh, text, Article 76, in reality, rules out the possibility of any independent running for the presidential elections. It enables party candidates uh, from the NDP as well, ruling National Democratic Party, as well as from opposition candidates to run, but it in reality, rules out the possibility of an independent running, which is a restriction, and the restrictions that Al-Baradi and anyone else who is interested and not organized in a political party, not a leader of political party, uh, will face approaching 2011. In fact, I have to say that there are no signs that the government is willing to amend Article 76 prior to the elections of 2011. Demands by the opposition were uh, rejected by the government uh, systematically in the last weeks. Then we have Article 77. Uh, which does not set term limits for the president. This has been a demand in Egypt since 2005. It's a renewed demand um, uh, since 2005, and the government, in spite of the fact that the constitution was amended uh, to, twice, 2005 and 2007, has always rejected any amendment that would set a term limit for the Egyptian uh, presidency. So if you look at the constitution and legal environment, it still shows great similarity to 2004 and 2005, in spite of the amendments, 05 and 07, still as restricted as it was with regard to parliamentary elections and with regard to presidential elections. Let me now move into um, um, looking at the different actors uh, and their platforms and their actions on the ground approaching the parliamentary and presidential elections. And, and I would divide um, the actors we are looking at in Egypt um, based on, on a trilateral division, government, formal opposition, and what I mean here are formal established legal political parties and informal opposition networks of activists and opposition dynamics. Now, the government is um, basically, to my mind, um, is undertaking five interesting or using um, five, five, uh, five uh, tools which are well known and have, have always been used. A, um, uh, of course, um, uh, rejecting um, any amendment that would change the restrictive nature of the legal and constitutional environment. As I said, no constitutional amendment, um, uh, continuation and renewal of the state of emergency, and so on and so forth. Secondly, targeted repression to, to uh, opposition activists and opposition leaders. Third, the government is trying to periodize the way it approaches the political calendar, the political cycle of Egypt into a division between parliamentary elections that uh, everyone should focus on right now and the postponed discussion about presidential elections which should start unfolding after the parliamentary elections. Of course, parliamentary elections are going to be the scene setter in different ways for the presidential elections, but the government is trying to say, let's do the parliamentary elections first, fair and free and pluralist. We have parties which run. President Mubarak said that a few, a few days ago. And let's postpone uh, discussion on the presidential elections to 2011. In a way, trying to push al Baradi um, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to a marginal place in the Egyptian public um, and political debate. Four, the government is um, trying to, to, to use its influence on legal established political parties to make sure that they will stay on its side. Parties such as the Wafd, the liberal Wafd, or parties such as the leftist unionist party, the Tagamma, or other parties which have come to depend on the government to, to, to secure their share in the People's Assembly, their minimal share in the People's Assembly and the Shura Council, continue to, de to depend on the government and in a way continue to be co-opted and domesticated, a domesticated opposition of sorts. This um, is continuing as well. Finally, um, once again, a reform-based, a democracy-based government rhetoric, um, um, which is um, becoming less and less credible because even if you take items such as ending the state of emergency, President Mubarak uh, promised to do it in 2005, it's yet to be done. They promised to ease restrictions on political parties, it's yet to be done. They promised to, to, um, uh, to replace the judicial supervision uh, of elections with uh, a national council, a national commission on elections that is independent and neutral, and this is not the case. So, however, we still have a democracy-based government rhetoric that is trying to say, well, Parliamentary elections will be conducted fair and free. The president himself said that he is happy to see Egypt, be, uh, Egyptians becoming more interested in politics. The last statement, dynamism and, and, and mobility are good. So we still have par par parts of that as well. The second component, I'm, 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 am I running out of time? Still have 
five months, okay. Second component is formal, conventional, uh, or legal uh, political parties. And as I said, we, we can, apart from uh, junior, junior parties, such as the Democratic Front of uh, Osama al-Ghazali Harb, or al-Ghad, which is divided and embattled internally, Legal political parties have come to be co-opted by the government and depend on the government in securing their share. So do not expect much from them. In fact, they are even not endorsing the demands put forward by in informal opposition groups or by activists to amend the constitution, to ease restrictions. They are not even endorsing the demands to, to um, uh, push for democratic reforms in Egypt. What, what, what we should keep in mind is that those parties, in spite of the fact that they, in some cases, have um, uh, uh, a good infrastructure and have representation across the country, such as Al-Wafd. al, -Wafd. al -Wafd is the only party, apart from the National Democratic, uh, ruling National Democratic Party, which has branches everywhere in Egypt. It's the only party which has branches everywhere. Apart from the fact that they do have an infrastructure and organizational solidity of sorts, they are inactive and have lost credibility. The third component, which is sort of, once again, the sort of, just, just like 2004 and 2005, the source of uh, injection of dynamism into Egyptian politics is informal opposition. And while we had, as I said, in 2004 and 2005, Kifaya, we have this time Al Baradi and his movement for change, and we continue to have the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, the big change uh, in relation to the informal opposition dynamics is, uh, is that in 2004 and 2005, the Muslim Brotherhood was seen as the leading actor. In 2010, I dare say that it's not the case. The Muslim Brotherhood is trying to join, to harmonize its act activism, its actions on the ground with the demands and the platform of the national movement for change. Today, uh, the march which was supposed to, to, to address demands for constitution change to uh, Speaker of Parliament was co-organized by the Muslim Brotherhood and the National Movement for Change of al and there are other different signs. The platform goes in the right direction, as, as I outlined at the beginning. However, what the group of, of al Baradi lacks is an action plan, and a plan which addresses the question of what's next. What if the government refuses and continues to reject successfully demands to amend the constitution? What if Dr. Baradi cannot run in the presidential elections of 2011? What are they going to do about the parliamentary elections? What are they going to do if he cannot run? Uh, do they have a platform on concrete social, economic, and political issues? Is it um, 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 a platform for national consensus, for change, or is it a platform as well for actions in a tough political cycle and a tough political calendar we are looking at? They lack that. As I said at the beginning, Dr. Baradi brings in international recognition and a degree of domestic recognition. However, he has been attacked systematically by the semi-government uh, press, by, se by government uh, voices, as someone who does not know much about Egypt. He rom rom romanticized a bit at the beginning uh, about Egyptian society and uh, what we call in Egypt al-Ashwa'iyat, which are places where uh, impoverished sections of the population live. Uh, around Cairo and in big urban centers. He rom romanticized a bit, giving a um, uh, chance for the government voices to criticize him as someone who does not know the country really. Secondly, he has been pushed by some elements, uh, some members inside his group to address issues which, to my mind, he should not address, such as the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty, the wall in Gaza. Uh, so he moved from a domestic-based platform into addressing some regional issues, and here he is being criticized. However, in spite of those government-sponsored uh, attacks on him, he still represents a big shift in the informal opposition spectrum as compared to 2004 and 2005. We have a candidate who can be reckoned with and who everyone is taking seriously in Egypt and probably outside. Finally, Al-Ikhwan, the Muslim Brotherhood, as part of the, of the informal opposition spectrum, I suspect two, two, two main features to understand what, what the Muslim Brotherhood is probably going to do in 2010-2011. A, the movement is recovering from a period of instability. <coughs> Which, um, which the movement um, uh, had to go through between 06, 07, and 2009. It's, re it's re-stabilizing. It's finally developing, once again, a platform about domestic issues in Egypt. The movement in 07, 08, and 09 was debating primarily its own internal affairs. Uh, sort of the clearest sign was the last elections, internal elections for the guidance office. It's re-stabilizing. It's recovering developing a domestic platform, but unlike 2004 and 2005, it's no longer the leading 
part in the informal spectrum. It's joining um, uh, the platform and the demands put forward by Baradi and his group. Secondly, I suspect that the movement is going to uh, uh, practice its role in Egyptian politics in 2010-2011 based on the self-limiting self principle. I do not see the movement uh, hoping to get more than a couple of seats in the Shura Council elections, if any, and Michel reminded me of the fact that they never managed to win a single seat in, in, in the Shura Council. I do not see the movement expecting to win more than maybe anywhere between 10 and 20, and this is based on interviews which my colleague Nathan Brown and myself conducted recently with Ikhwan's leaders. They do not expect to have more than anywhere between 10 and 20, which would mean down from 88, from a big par uh, parliamentary block into um, uh, a, tiny, uh, a tiny representation. I do not see the movement provoking the Egyptian government by using the street uh, intensively. They would probably continue to co-organize events and demonstrations with Baradi or informal opposition actors, but they would not use the street intensively, intensively uh, to avoid provoking the government. Finally, um, um, the big question, should the constitution be amended, which I do not see happening, should it theoretically, should the constitution be amend, amended, Article 76, to enable independence to run, the big question becomes, would the Muslim Brotherhood nominate an independent candidate? Because once you make the conditions more flexible, theoretically they can feel the candidate, they could feel the candidate. Should that happen, and I, I do not see it happening, should that happen, I suspect that the movement would try to keep al-Baradi as the single opposition candidate and would, in fact, even without endorsing him, um, uh, either play it based on the gray zone uh, model, which they have always used successfully, endorsing and not endorsing, or at any rate, uh, not fielding an, a candidate against him, a second opposition candidate against him. I hope, I hope this gives you an idea of what's going on in Egypt, and I would be happy to take your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amr. Uh, okay, now we're going to have some comments by Jeremy Sharp, and uh, I think Jeremy's going to uh, comment on the situation in Egypt as well as sort of putting it in a regional context and a little bit of a U.S. policy context. Thanks, Michelle. And thank you to the Carnegie Endowment for having me today. Uh, thank you to Amr for your presentation, always insightful. Those of us who are desk jockeys in Washington rely on your analysis tremendously, so thank you. And thank you to Michelle for having me. I've told you this in, pub in private, but I'll tell you in public, you've always been a role model. So I appreciate your, uh, your expertise and combined with a fresh, refreshing sense of humility. So thank you. Um, as Michelle said, I'm going to uh, expand on an Amr's presentation specifically from a, a U.S. policy standpoint. And I'd like to go back to what he was saying about the renewal of the emergency laws, because I think we're going to be talking about elections, uh, Egyptian elections in this town for the next uh, two years. Um, we still have some time. Uh, but the emergency laws is a, is a, is a policy issue that, that's happening uh, right now. Uh, on May 26 of 2008, the uh, People's Assembly renewed them for two years, so this is something that could happen uh, potentially this month. Now, uh, in April, the April 6 movement protest, um, in, in response, the State Department issued a statement saying, quote, we are deeply concerned about the arrests of Egyptians under the emergency law. Uh, referring to the emergency law, then Gamal last week, as Amr mentioned, said, quote, uh, this is commenting on a possible extension. He said, the party, this is from al Masri al the party will ask the government to place some additional controls on the state of emergency if it has to extend it in such a way as to be bound by some guarantees and pledges that the application be confined to the crimes and threats of terrorism only. Um, of course, this is referring to the uh, uh, possible anti-terrorism legislation that has been talked about for quite some time. So, with the emergency law, uh, I'd like to sort of pose the question, what, what is our government, what is the administration doing right now? Uh, and what has it been doing in the past few months to, to address this extension? Uh, are there discussions behind closed doors about it? If it's extended, uh, how are we going to react? Um, and I, I, I sort of looked up past, past statements on the extension. So in 2006, State Department said, quote, it's a disappointment. Uh, and then referred to President Mubarak's campaign, campaign pledge in 2005, uh, 2005 to, have a, to, to abrogate the emergency law and have some new anti-terrorism legislation. In 2008, when it was extended, <laughs> quote, it's disappointing that they, dis they, they, that they did decide to extend the state of emergency. We would urge them to pass a law, and then it goes on to talk about the uh, anti-terrorism law. So again, this is something to, to look at now. It can be sort of a barometer for how our government reacts uh, to parliamentary elections later this year and then to presidential elections in 2011. 
Uh, Amr also sort of got at this, this notion of, of confrontation. And I think it's very important. We were discussing this earlier. Um, what happens when push comes to shove uh, for El Baradai's movement? Um, you know, does he have does he have the stomach for confrontation, either or violent or nonviolent? And I, I was looking at this uh, Egyptian blogger, many of you know, Bahia. She wrote, "Quote: El Baradai raises the costs of electoral engineering." And I guess I would sort of think about it: if, if El Baradai is not able to peel off. NDP elites to his cause, if he's not able to get more establishment support, what next? Uh, w what is he going to do to, to sort of raise the stakes? Saad Idi Mirhim recently said uh, to, for al Baradai to follow the path, quote, of civil disobedience and to make sacrifices like Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. How is he going to do this without provoking a severe response from the security forces? How are the security forces going to respond to him if he's, quote, as Egyptians say, an, an international? Is he courting the security forces? What is, what is that relationship going on? Is he trying to? I, I think he's, uh, he said some things in public that would probably anger the, the Egyptian military and the interior security, criticizing, as Amr mentioned, the, uh, the steel barrier going up in Rafah, which Egyptians feel is very much a national security issue. Finally, you know, we're going to talk about elections, and we always talk about reform, but it's always very important to just put it in a regional context. This morning, Prime Minister Netanyahu, as all of you read, is in Sharm el-Sheikh. Uh, the proximity talks are about to be restarted. Uh, the Arab League has endorsed this now twice, thanks to a strong role uh, that Egypt, Egypt has played in this. Egypt this morning declared a national emergency on their border uh, with Rafa, fearing another uh, Hamas border breach in retaliation for the four tunnelers who were killed last week. So we, we can't dismiss the regional context. Uh, it's very important. The peace process is something that is going to be important for this administration for the time being. And while we would like to think that pushing political reform and the peace process are not mutually exclusive, it's a very hard act to do. And I'm certainly not in government in that position. And uh, I. I feel badly for those people who have to sort of walk that fine line, but it's something to, to, to look at very carefully. Um, hopefully we can sort of flush this out more in, uh, in questions and answers. So thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, okay. Um, well, I'm, I don't know about all of you. I have a whole bunch of questions, but I'm just going to, I'm going to ask, take the privilege of asking one or two quickly before I open up the floor. Amr, I want to ask you, in the light of everything that you, you, uh, described and, uh, in the light of a, a fairly restrictive legal and constitutional environment and so forth, so, what do elections really count for in Egypt at this point? Um, why, why are they important? Are they important? What would be the significance? I mean, what would, what would come out of these? Let's just look at the parliamentary elections for the moment. Focus on that. What would be the, what, what's the significance of this? What kind of impact can whatever happens in the parliamentary elections have on Egypt as a nation going forward and possibly on the, the presidential election and succession process after that. That's question number one. The other one is just a, a shorter one. You know, I was kind of intrigued by what you were saying about the Muslim Brotherhood being resigned to uh, winning only, say, 10 to 20 seats in the parliament this time around as opposed to the 88 they got five years ago. So what does that mean? Are, do they believe that they will not be able to field as many candidates that they that you know they'll face, for example, the refusal to register their candidates that they faced in local elections over the past couple of years? Do they think there will be more rigging in the elections? I mean, at the at the actual polling places, do they think that they have less support? Do they think they're going to be less able to mobilize people to to go out and vote for them? Right. Well, let me, thank you very much, Michelle. Let me start with the second question. Um, on, uh, on the Muslim Brotherhood, it's a mix of, uh, of the different factors which you refer to. Um, the movement, in spite of its 88 seats, um, has um, presented itself to its constituents, to the wider Egyptian public, as in, in the last years, between 2005 and 2010, as a divided movement 
as a movement which uh, does not have a clear platform on different domestic issues. All of us do remember the debate which took place in relation to the draft party platform which was released in 2007. The more recent debate uh, following the guidance office prior and during and following the guidance office elections, the internal elections in the movement, the movement did not present itself as a solid, homogeneous movement with a clear platform to convince um, Egyptians. In fact, the there are different accounts, and I, I tend to go in, in, in that direction, that the movements uh, with, with different steps have angered uh, core constituents by becoming more um, uh, interested in socioeconomic issues in the People's Assembly and less interested in moral sharia-driven issues uh, by pushing for um, 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 a draft party platform that did not, from for, for the core constituency of religious inspired uh, Muslim Brotherhood um, uh, supporters that did not go enough in the direction of pushing for an application of Sharia and so on and so forth. So definitely factor A, less support. Secondly, which is more, more significant, is, and based on, on the experience between 2006, 2007, up until now, the movement knows that the government will not, will not let it register and run as many candidates as it did in, in, in 2005. In 2005, some of you might remember, the movement ran 150. Uh, candidates ended up winning 88 seats. Um, in, 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 the show, in, in the local council elections of 2007, um, the movement, in spite of its attempt to field uh, over 1,000, if I'm not mistaken, ended up managing to register less than 20 and boycotted the elections for what it described as regime uh, outright repression. They know that they will not be allowed to, to run as many candidates. In a way, the government in Egypt post-2005 is probably less interested, less keen on rigging the elections and more keen on transferring the manipulation to, uh, uh, to the day prior to, prior to the election day. So sort of the manipulation takes place before you go to, uh, to the polls. Um, thirdly, um, what do they do out of that? I guess the movement has always managed to contain uh, regime hits and ups and downs in their political representation in fact, in a very good manner, depending on the social and wider religious and social da'wah activities, social and religious activities, which they have always invested in. So it's, it's, um, they take it into consideration, and I do not see them protesting against it in any meaningful way. Um, on elections, and what do they count for? And, and focusing on, on the parliamentary elections, well, they do count for, to my mind, A, if you look at it from, from, from a government perspective, from within the ruling establishment, the uh, parliamentary elections of 2010 for the Shura Council and People's Assembly are going to be a new test for Gamal Mubarak and his group. Can they manage it? I mean, as you know, and we were discussing it earlier, in 2005, uh, NDP candidates, straightforward NDP candidates, did not win more than 30% of the seats of the People's Assembly. The NDP came to its two-third majority because the so-called NDP independents rejoined the party after the elections. This was a test which was, a fa in fact, a failure for Gamal and his group. Now, he is going to be tested for a second time in 2010 uh, in relation to parliamentary elections. The parliamentary elections, the result of the parliamentary elections are going to represent a scene setter for the presidential elections. Are we going to have a People's Assembly with 20, 25% opposition representation or 5 to 10% opposition representation, which would be a sign for a presidential uh, contest or presidential elections that will not, um, uh, are not going to be in, 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 in any way more pluralist than the ones which we have in 2005. Uh, parliamentary elections are influential because they are going definitely to, to, to clarify the relative um, uh, weight and the potential significance of different opposition moves. We are going to see approaching the parliamentary elections, can the movement of Dr. Baradai brings down its platform on constitution amendments and democracy into an action plan, into steps? Can, can they field candidates? Can they run election campaigns? Yes or no? Or would they face the same limitations which Kifaya faced in 2004 and 2005 and ended up being a movement that put forward all the right demands but did not, did not push significantly for any one of them? Because imagining that you can generate in Egypt enough popular, popular pressure to force the government to change is misleading. So in, 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 in elections are significant because 
we are going to test the impact of the Constitution amendments, removing judicial oversight. What does it mean on, uh, on the ground? Um, everyone is pushing for international monitoring and domestic monitoring for the first time. Egyptian opposition, religious, unreligious, le liberal, leftists are pushing for that. Is that going to, to materialize? Is the government going to accept it? So there are different questions which are key for Egyptian politics where we can use the elections as a test case. Are the elections going to change Egyptian politics to push for more democratization now? Uh, as far as I can tell, the government is going to play it as it has always played it in a, in a, in a semi-pluralist, in a restrictive manner, and this, is, this will not change. Thank you, Amr. And uh, Jeremy, I just want to ask you a little bit more about sort of the, the choices for the United States and its policy toward Egypt uh, as we move toward these elections. You mentioned uh, the regional context and how important the uh, Israeli-Palestinian peace process is to the administration. Um, it, could you reflect for us a little bit the thinking that you hear, whether within the administration or on Capitol Hill, about this kind of thing? Is there a sense that um, uh, is there is there a sense of concern that uh, President Mubarak or others in the Egyptian leadership would not put forward effort on the uh, on the Arab-Israeli peace process if the United States were raising at the same time issues related to democracy and elections and so forth? Or is there a, a more fundamental concern that somehow uh, if the United States starts, you know, pressing a little bit more for democracy that there would actually be a leadership change uh, that, that could go against U.S. interests? I mean, what what is the kind of concerns that you hear more from your, uh, from your purchase? at CRS. And the other thing is this issue of international monitoring that Amr raised, uh, that he feels the, you know, there's much more um, acceptance of this, at least in the opposition in Egypt, that, that international monitoring of elections would be desirable. Uh, do you think this is, you know, has this sort of come to the minds of people on the Hill, for example, yet, uh, you know, pushing for international monitoring of the elections? Sure. Thank you. Uh, the Egyptian government's position and, and perception in Washington, frankly, is, is quite strong. It's, it's a, there's a very good, uh, there's a very positive atmosphere surrounding U.S.-Egyptian bilateral relations, more so than there's been in, in, in recent years. Now, that could um, somewhat change as we get closer into a, a election season, um, but it's, it's partially a byproduct of very strong uh, Again, government to government, Egyptian-Israeli relations. Some observers have observed that Egyptian-Israeli relations are maybe not people to people, but at a government to government level, better than they've been in, in many years. And I think there's um, there's some proof to that and some some truth to that. Uh, so I, I think it, you know, and sort of relate it back to to what's going on in Capitol Hill. If, for those of you who've been here for several year, for several years, you'll remember the the condition, conditionality language on Egypt's foreign aid that was passed. Uh, several years ago. It was tied to a number of things, to judicial reform, human rights, but also tied to Egyptian, uh, Egyptians' position vis-a-vis -vis the smuggling uh, between Egypt and Gaza. And that, I would say, by far was the driver behind that, that conditionality language. It was, a, it was a regional context. Now, people uh, would have liked to have thought that it was, it was because of its political reform record, but it, it had to do very much more with the uh, Arab-Israeli conflict and how it plays out in Washington. So I guess the general point is, as long as uh, Egyptian or Israeli government-to-government -government relations are strong, there's, it's going to be harder uh, for Washington in this town to sort of take a much tougher approach on the political reform issue. And that, that isn't, th those relations aren't changing exactly uh, just yet. Um, in, in terms of international monitoring, I think AID is a very sort of robust uh, technical assistance program from what I've seen I haven't seen everything uh, relating to the relating to the elections um, I think the position is is that they're training domestic Egyptian domestic monitors now uh, the the role of to the best of my knowledge of international monitoring is not something that we're I don't know if it's I'm sure we're contemplating it. it's not something certainly that we're, we're from a programmatic level that's happening at the moment um, and I'm not uh, at, you know, we're just getting into sort of Egyptian election season here in Washington, so perhaps this could become more of an issue, but it hasn't to this point. 
Okay, thank you. All right, so we'll open it up for questions now. We do have a microphone, so please, um, I'll, I'll recognize you, and then uh, this gentleman here can have the first question. And please, please identify yourself, ask your question, and then uh, uh, let us know if there. Let me know if there's a specific panelist you want to answer. You question to Amr uh, to Amr Hamzawi. Uh, my name is Amin Mahmoud. I'm with Alliance of Egyptian American. Uh, we, we have to remember that the uh, Baradai movement is two months and ten days. We have to be fair with him. And his movement uh, getting a lot of momentum now. And he depend on the mandate of people to sign for him. If you have a one million signature, he can influence Washington and the, and the Egyptian government as, as well. He is not depending on Washington to do anything because he knows the situation which Jeremy talked about. I would like to see your opinion. Okay. Do you like to collect questions and take some individually? Okay. Well, right. Thank you very much. On, on um, of course, I, I, I mean, I, I see your point. And in fairness to El Baradai, um, his movement is new, has changed in, in fact, in a few weeks, uh, has changed the appearance of Egyptian politics. I mean, I refer to words such as stagnation, stalemate, uh, too much stability, which we use to, to employ and use to char characterize Egyptian politics right now. I mean, we can use different words. We use different words, dynamic, uh, becoming more interesting, or once again interesting, and so on and so forth. However, and I do agree with much of what Al Baradi's movement has been putting forward, demands for constitutional change, changing the restrictive legal environment, and he is, definitely correct on saying that without changing the environment, it makes no sense to continue and regenerate a game of uh, limited political competition, which leads only to uh, legitimizing whatever the regime uh, tries to get out of elections, parliamentary or presidential, and legitimizing the outcome as democratic, and it's not. So I, 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 here, here there is much credit to be given to Dr. Abbaradi, where he and his movement have not developed enough answers uh, up until now is to my mind at two levels. A, how to translate the platform into an action plan. And it's not enough to say that, well, let's try to get Egyptians to demonstrate on a daily basis because they are not going to do it. And it's not enough to tell Egyptians, uh, well, get out of your, uh, of your place and demonstrate for constitution change and democracy unless you relate it in a meaningful way to their daily life, to their so the so social and economic conditions under which uh, a great majority of Egyptians uh, has been living and those conditions have been deteriorating unless you do that and they have not been able to do it. Second, so you, so you need an action plan. Secondly, I see no good reason for Dr. Baradi to keep shifting from a focus, uh, uh, a, a focus which I, I would say is more than important, on domestic issues into statements on regional and international issues that are only, in fact, eating away from his international and parts of his uh, domestic credibility. Thirdly, and, and Jeremy's point was, um, uh, was very significant, uh, I mean, asking, is Dr. Baradi trying to appeal to at least components or parts of the ruling establishment or not? I mean, Egypt change in Egyptian politics, uh, an opening in Egyptian politics of sorts, will not happen against the will of the ruling establishment. You have to find ways to dialogue at least with them. Is he dialoguing with anyone? I do not have that impression. In his last statements on Gaza, on the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty, as Jeremy mentioned, have led to a anger among the military establishment, security and intelligence establishment, and unfortunately he is still trying to, in an un undecided manner, uh, to, to, to play um, uh, a double-sided game of um, I am here because I'm interested in reforming Egypt and I do not have to be a candidate in the presidential elections. And, well, I am the candidate for, uh, for uh, uh, Egyptians in the presidential elections if you give me your mandate and if we can change the environment. He has to, he has to become more clear on A, what does he stand for, B, what is how to tackle the question, what's next if the government refuses to, uh, to, uh, to amend the constitution? And he has to become clear on, is he part of it, or is he only sort of a temporary phenomenon, which will wither away and disappear once the government says no to constitutional amendments, and once we have 
as we had in 2005, parliamentary and presidential elections that are not going to lead to any change. We still have a Mubarak maybe up there, and we still have a, a, a comfortable majority for the NDP in the People's Assembly. Okay. This, Ali. So I want to get clarity on this. Is Could you Bradley, identify yourself, please? Yeah. Thank you. Nervat Hatim. Um, I mean, is this a movement for change or is it more of the same? And is, I mean, um, I was interested in the international dimension, not in relation to the US, but in relation to the fact that privatization in Egypt has accelerated during the last several years, and therefore um, international investors as well as donors might not necessarily be interested in, um, uh, in change, and that the only movement in fairly large numbers um, that is connected to some significant change is the workers' movement, but that, of course, is not really part of this movement for change, and therefore, I mean, so what are we looking at, sort of more of the same? I mean, you, you mentioned, Amr, that it was more or less a repeat of 2005 mm -hmm. and six, and therefore, I mean, and they haven't learned the lessons of that particular period. So why would there be any attempt at sort of thinking of them as associated with a significant movement for change? Is it more of the same, or is it really some kind of change. Mm -hmm. I'm going to collect a couple of more questions. Uh, right here, Mame. Um, Cynthia Anthony with the American University in Cairo. Um, just a quick question. What Does the Kafaya movement as such still exist? What What's happened to those supporters? Have they gone over to the movement for change or um, gone elsewhere or hopefully not? Have they? Mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna, I'll have one more question and then we'll answer a few. I'll come back. I'm Rafi Danziger from APAC, and my first question is directed to uh, Amr. And uh, that is with regard to the MPT review conference that began today. That reports that Egypt is pushing very hard for a resolution that would put the Israeli nuclear program on the agenda. And I was wondering if perhaps this is also driven to some extent by fear that Al Baradi, Bar Baradi is going to use this issue, uh, which is his baby, really, if uh, Egypt doesn't push hard enough on that. And to uh, Jeremy, what do you think is the American position on that issue of uh, the, uh, uh, the nuclear-free uh, Middle East? OK, let's answer those, and then we'll come back for some more questions. Uh, Mervat's, uh, Mervat's question. Um, well, two points here. One. Um, it is, it is in a way, it is in a way different and, and more significant than 2004 and 2005 because of Al Baradi's personality. And this was a great handicap. In 04 and 05, when Egyptians looked at what Kifaya was saying or what the informal opposition spectrum was putting forward, they saw demands, but they saw personalities, uh, which was, I mean, I would, I would put it in, I mean, informally, which, which were acting in a very weird manner, not saying the right things, which needed to be said. Baradai, in the first weeks, I would say, really did a very good job in highlighting the issue, putting the demands forward, making it clear that, well, amending the constitution is significant and important. But then I expected him to move beyond that in, in the direction of A, reaching out to big constituencies. And you mentioned one key constituency, Jeremy mentioned one, which is the ruling establishment. Is he trying to reach out to them, to components at least? Maybe some are, 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 are not, or are yet to be satisfied with the possibility of uh, the Gamal Mubarak succession. Has he been reaching out to the ruling establishment? And you mentioned the second big constituency, uh, workers, and those who stand behind the social and economic protest activism that has been um, gaining more ground in Egypt, at least in terms of the quantity of uh, number, total number of protest activities. He hasn't been doing a good job. I mean, there was only one statement from Baradi on May 1 addressed to Egyptian workers, congratulating them and asking them to join his movement for change. The change cannot be, cannot be reached uh, without um, uh, the working class. But there are no serious attempts, and I relate all that to the fact that they do not have an action plan. Um, um, sa secondly, secondly, on the international environment, I would say 
I mean, one, one of the assets of, um, uh, of Dr. Baladi is that he appeals to, at least theoretically, he appeals to, the, uh, and to external actors as someone who is known to be a liberal, who, do, who does not come in or did not go to Egypt with a revolutionary agenda changing Egyptian regional and international um, uh, preferences. In fact, he was looked at at the beginning as someone who represent, represents a continuity when it comes to regional and international preferences of Egypt and represents a good positive change, a democratic change domestically. Theoretically, someone like Baradi should appeal to, to external actors at the government to government level as well as to non-governmental, be it international investors or otherwise. However, he, to my mind, and here once again I criticize him and criticize the movement, he put forward some statements which did not serve to that end. As I say, once again, Gaza, the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty, he had an episode in which he addressed the Nasserist uh, era positively and negatively, Sadat's and Ftah policy positively and negatively, and he created the impression of someone who is being driven by a group of politicians, pro pro politicians um, uh, who are now around him, uh, I'm not going to refer to names. Uh, without knowing where he really stands and not making it clear for Egyptians where he stands. Second point, Cynthia, is on kifaya. Well, there are two kifayas. There is a kifaya of Abdul Halim uh, Andil and a kifaya Abdul Halim Andil. Um, you know him. If you live in Egypt, you have to know him. <laughs> you, can, you cannot avoid uh, knowing Abdul, <laughs> Abdul Halim. Okay, that's good. So um, I do not envy you. And now Abdul Halim Andil. Abdul Halim, Abdul Halim Andil's wing decided to not to join the National Movement for Change of Dr. Baradi and is still calling for a one million strong demonstration to topple the regime and take over the state, which will never happen. And the second wing of Kifaya around George Isha and some other activists, liberal and leftists, have joined the National Movement for Change and are becoming active, are active. Unfortunately, some of them are responsible for the mistakes of Dr. Baradi, which I refer to, sort of addressing uh, regional and international issues where it's not needed to do so. Uh, on the NPT final question, no, I do not see it driven by domestic uh, considerations. It's more driven by the regional competition between Egypt, Turkey, and Iran, and the need for Egypt, Egyptian foreign policy, to put forward a platform of sorts. Uh, an NPT, uh, uh, a Middle East uh, free of nuclear uh, weapons, is becoming once again an integral part of what the Egyptians are putting forward, and I would say rightly so, as a model for the region. Okay, right now. Do you want me to respond to her? Uh, I'm sorry. Oh. I didn't allow Jeremy to respond. Yeah. Please. It's okay. I'm sorry. After I said you were a role model, it's, just, <laughs> it's, it's a hard thing to stomach. Feet of clay. Um, <laughs> get me back for that later. Uh, Rafi, that was a very good question. Um, I guess my response is, as you know, this has been a, a long-standing position. Um, and I, you know, I think it's being pushed more aggressively now because, frankly, it's on the, it's on the table as an administration um, policy. Not not nuclear free Middle East, but uh, I mean, just the issue of talking about these things. Um, but at the same time, I mean, Mubarak has also said in public that an Iranian weapon would change our calculation. And so, you know, what does that mean, too? So, I mean, there, there are statements on either side that you can look at. It's also very interesting that uh, these statements are being made not, not more aggressively, just more publicly in the context of. Uh, ongoing U.S. Egyptian and U.S. Jordanian uh, one, two, three nuclear cooperation um, negotiations and how these statements will play into those bilateral negotiations, I'm not sure. Uh, Mervat uh, preempted the first part of my question, which was really on the sort of the protest movement. But I, uh, I'd like to push you on another potential constituency. If you look, where is the discontent in the country? And certainly there is the socioeconomic discontent. Then you have also mentioned another aspect, which is the discontent within the, the, the Juan. The people who do not uh, think that the policies of the present uh, parliamentary delegation represents right. what they have. Is there, you know, is that a constituency? constituency that's getting mobilized in any form, and is, if it does get mobilized, would it be mobilized against El Baraday rather than on the same side? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to take a couple of more uh, questions. This lady in the front here has been waiting patiently. Uh, my question is so... Could you identify yourself? Thank you. My name is Nadia 
Saad. I'm retired from the World Bank, but I'm a student of Middle Eastern stuff. Um, you, you talked very little about the formal opposition in Egypt. Now, I would like to know how strong is the Liberal Party of Osama, um, Razali Harb, and what was his position? What is his position towards the Baradari? Is there any other opposition, formal opposition? And that's one question. The other question is that, don't you think that El Baradai, by talking about Gaza, is counting on the sentiment of, uh, let's say, the Egyptian street of, of the people? Right. <clears throat> okay, we'll take one more. Uh, this lady on the same side. Oh, thank you. Hello, my name is Nasima Noor. I'm with the National Democratic Institute. I wanted to ask Dr. Hamzawi a question regarding um, what he called a test case, how the parliamentary elections will be a test case for um, the constitutional amendments and the lack of judicial oversight. I was wondering if you also um, consider the parliamentary elections or you think it might be a test case with regard to President Mubarak passing power to his son Gamal, um, if the government sees the election somehow as I guess a harbinger, um, if there aren't as many protests, for example, or if the protests die down, it might signal to them that the public will, in fact, accept the secession. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, let's okay. go ahead and answer right. those. Mm -hmm. um, Marina, your question on, on uh, discontent and constituencies, uh, different constitu constituencies in Egypt. On, on, on al Ikhwan, yes, and there are, there are um, some signs, there is good evidence, in fact, that some, some of the Ikhwan's members, primarily young generation members and supporters, who became disillusioned with the movement in the last years for different reasons, lack of um, uh, uh, effectiveness of uh, the parliamentary platform, um, the appearance of the movement as a divided movement, uh, the inability of the movement to move in a clear direction toward moderation, equality between Muslims and Copts, sort of endorse uh, equal citizenship rights, equality between men and women, the inability um, uh, of Al-Ikhwan to project a clear, um, a clear, um, uh, a clear vision. There are some, there is some evidence that those are moving and are becoming more inspired by Al-Baradi and by the national movement for change, but they were also inspired by a movement like April 6. Some of them jo joined April 6 as a protest network. So yes, um, is, is Al-Baradi or his group trying to reach out uh, systematically to those? No, they are not doing it. But they are also not reaching out to potential, very significant constituencies in Egypt. Well, I would have imagined someone like Al-Baradi to try to reach out to the business community, because with his assets, uh, he should be more appealing to the business community than, let us say, Hamdin Sabahi of the Nasserist uh, Karama Party or someone like um, uh, Osama al-Ghazali Harb of the Liberal uh, National Democratic Front or Democratic Front. I would have imagined Baradi to do more. He has done some of that in terms of reaching out to the Coptic community in Egypt. I mean, there, there, were, some, there were some signs. He went to the uh, Easter service, attended the Easter service, uh, some debates in Egypt which were uh, inspired by that, but he hasn't done enough in terms of reaching out to Copts uh, as a constituency as well, be it in Egypt or outside, uh, outside Egypt. So in, in overall, his movement lacks um, uh, an action plan which a political actor would need approaching parliamentary and presidential elections. Can they put it forward? I really doubt it very much. I really doubt it very much. Now, second question by Nadia uh, on, on formal opposition parties and Osama al-Ghazali Harb's uh, Democratic Front specifically. Well, formal opposition parties, you can, you can look at them using sort of a simple duality. Um, established parties such as the Liberal WAV, Leftist uh, Unionist Party, have bought into the sem semi-pluralism of Egyptian politics uh, a long time ago. They have become, uh, you can use a decent phrase like domesticated uh, opposition or a less decent phrase, co-opted by the government, but there's not much to be expected from them. And then you have a second component, uh, parties which were recently uh, legalized, uh, were allowed, received a license from the uh, committee um, that license uh, political parties and that is controlled by the NDP and the government. Um, the Democratic Front of Osama al-Ghazali Harb is one of them. They are trying to, to do, um, uh, to get active in Egypt based on a double-sided uh, strategy. One, they try to make it clear in the public space that formal established 
opposition parties are not doing what they are expected to do. And secondly, they are trying to join the informal opposition spectrum. So Osama al-Ghazali Harb is um, uh, a founding member of the National Movement for Change. His party has done uh, a try to co-organize some of the events with April 6, with the National Movement for Change of uh, al-Baradi. However, let's keep in mind that the share of Egyptians, which I should have said that at the very beginning, I mean the share of Egyptians who have been participating in those activities, uh, formal opposition, informal opposition, Ikhwan or otherwise, Barabi or otherwise, is not more than 10% of eligible voters. So let's keep the dimension in mind. We still are looking at a very tiny share of eligible voters. And, 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 and the clear majority is, uh, remains, unfortunately, influenced by political apathy and by deteriorating social economic conditions which um, uh, eat away from, from their capacity to b become interested in public uh, public affairs. Nasima on, yes, it's very much a test case for Gamal Mubarak and for the succession scenario as well. As I said, and this was part of a discussion which Michelle and I had earlier today, 2005 was the elections, was managed from an NDP perspective by Gamal and his group, especially the first phase. They failed drastically. Then the management of elections was taken over by the security apparatus and by the so-called old guard inside the party. This time, Gamal and his group, and you can see that if you look at Ahmad Az and his role in nominating and fielding, agreeing on the candidates who are going to be nominated for the NDP, the elections are going to be managed by Gamal and his group, and a second test case, can he do it or not? And I would relate to that the issue which you mentioned on popular discontent. Are we going to see clear and, 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 and clear signs of popular discontent, or is it going to be accepted and moderated in, in, in public opinion uh, views and trends? in a way giving a chance for, for the succession scenario. Thanks, Jeremy. But yeah, just very briefly on your, on your question, it's a very good one. And, and of course, um, playing the, the populism card is, 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 uh, is a good tactic, but I, I guess what we were saying earlier is the military and security forces, they, they are a constituency. So you can play the, the, the popular card without um, alienating the military and security subject. Why do that so early on in the game? Um, as like someone in the audience said, he's only been in, been in Egypt for two and a half months. And so uh, if you're going to take this sort of Obama approach and reach out to all these different constituencies, you probably, it's not the best tactic to sort of anger the army from the get-go. Okay. Uh, question here? Uh, Laura Schultz? Yeah. Yeah, he, no, he's, he's, yeah. Thanks. You're on my list, don't worry. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Laura Schultz from Congressional Research Service. Um, question for Amr. Um, building on this, building on the discussion about um, Baraday's constituency and, and areas where he hasn't been as effective in reaching out and cultivating support. Um, where, where has he been successful? Um, it, to the extent that there are indicators that there's support outside of Cairo, that there's support um, any, anywhere beyond this 10% that you just talked about, that's kind of the traditional politically active. What is, what is your sense of kind of the composition of, of his movement at this point? Okay, back of the room, what does? Th uh, thanks, Michelle. Um, um, Amr and Jeremy, thank you so much. Um, Could you introduce yourself? I'm Mataz Zahran. I'm with the Embassy of uh, Egypt. Thank you. Um, I, I would probably just start by uh, agreeing with Amr that uh, politics has uh, uh, never been uh, clean or never been innocent uh, uh, anywhere, Egypt, in Egypt or in any other place. Uh, I will probably just distance myself just a little bit uh, or maybe just uh, a significant part uh, in uh, characterizing the uh, political uh, space in Egypt as being corrupt. It's too general, uh, too wide in, in, in nature. Uh, no one's perfect uh, and uh, nothing is perfect. Um, I, I would just jump from that to um, ask you a question on the um, what you see. Is there a room in your analysis that would uh, attribute the current uh, mobility as you've uh, uh, characterized it, um, or dynamism in uh, Egypt, in uh, politics, um, uh, to the uh, latest uh, developments since 2004, as you've referred to 2005 with the uh, amendments to the Constitution 2007 with uh, sweeping uh, other amendments. Is there 
um, room in your analysis to attribute the current uh, uh, dynamism in Egypt to that. Now, I'll just uh, jump to the uh, uh, Baradei factor, as uh, you called it. Um, he's been criticized in Egypt by many. He's also been praised by many, and he's been supported by many. Uh, this is probably an essence of uh, a, a democratic exchange. Um, is there... Uh, room. What do you think hinders him from joining at least a dozen uh, parties from 24, uh, from joining one of these parties and presenting himself as, as, as a candidate? One last point on the uh, emergency law. I don't like it and I don't think uh, anyone here from uh, whether in this room or at, at the embassy even uh, likes the emergency law. Many of my colleagues also in Egypt don't like it and are working for its abolishment. There's a fine line between guaranteeing civil, civil uh, liberties and uh, facing security challenges and threats uh, that needs to be preserved, whether through an emergency law or through an anti-terrorism law. Um, uh, uh, referring to the law in terms of, or attributing um, incidents, have a question. very quickly, uh, incidents to the emergency law is probably simply faulty. Uh, those on the 6th of April, um, were uh, questioned and released uh, according to uh, regular uh, laws that apply. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll take one more question right now from uh, right back here from, I think it's, yeah, Mark Platner. Please identify yourself. Mark Platner, uh, Journal of Democracy. Thanks. I just wanted to ask what we know about the state of President Mubarak's health and uh, even if, if to what we know, uh, is, uh, it's in good shape, still, the man is quite old. You're talking about a 15-month process. What happens if he were to become incapacitated or die and somewhere in the middle of this? Is it chaos? What, what might be the effect? turns 82 tomorrow. Right. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Right. I'm not taking out. No? Okay. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> Um, but, um, let me start with your question, Mark. <laughs> it's um, um, well. I, what I what I uh, what I can say is that according to the Constitution, uh, and based on the Constitution amendments of 2007, if the president is incapacitated, this was one 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 of the uh, um, amendments. Uh, that injected uh, a new element uh, in the Constitution. If the President is incapacitated, we have 60 days in which the Speaker of the People's Assembly, uh, in which the, the President will have to uh, uh, announce, or it will have to be announced that the President is incapacitated. The uh, Speaker of the People's Assembly calls for elections in 60 days. So according to the Constitution, uh, there is a a way, a scenario to manage uh, the situation should Egypt's president uh, become incapacitated. Uh, the second point, um, well, let me let me let me just say that it's never chaos in Egypt. I mean, I, it's, we are we are looking at a strong state, and in spite of the different difficulties which state institutions have been running into, uh, lack of legitimacy, deteriorating social and economic conditions, growing signs for popular discontent, the state is still state institutions are still able to manage changes, uh, even at the highest level in terms of managing politics at in the presidency uh, according to uh, the agreed upon set of rules and regulations. The big question in Egypt, which no one can really answer, and there are controversial signs, um, is basically, and, and to put it in a nutshell, does the ruling establishment have any different alternative succession scenario apart from the Gamal succession scenario, yes or no? So is it only a one shot which they are taking to put Mubarak's junior in place of Mubarak senior, beaten in 2010, 2011, um, or are there alternative scenarios? Before the president's sickness, it was widely debated in Egypt that President Mubarak himself is going to run for a sixth term in 2011. And this was becoming to be sort of the most expected scenario. Humbly, I would say this is becoming less and less feasible in view of the sickness and in view of the fact that President Mubarak for the first time disappeared for several weeks 
uh, from the scene and uh, physically disappeared. News coverage uh, on the president uh, disappe disappeared as well. So the question is, does the ruling establishment have, apart from the Gamal scenario, other succession scenarios? I would expect that they must have uh, plan B and plan C, but what those are, there are only rumors. A military establishment representative, a consensus figure, a Omar Suleiman uh, figure, or Omar Suleiman himself. I mean, but, but you know that. Um, um, constituencies, um, where a Baradi, uh, your question, Laura, where a Baradi has been successful, to my mind, the Baradi has been successful in relation primarily, uh, which is a surprise, in relation to Egyptians uh, residing outside Egypt. This is where we have had the clearest signs of uh, support for the Baradi in Kuwait, in the UAE, as well as in the US, really across the board. Domestically, El Baradi has been successful in mobilizing, tapping into uh, youth activism, young generation activism, but he did not shape it. It was out there since 2005, 2006, April 6 movement, similar movements, young members in Ikhwan, young members elsewhere. He has been able to tap into that and mobilize them. And those are the ones who have uh, created the Facebook presence of El Baradi, uh, his website, Twitter presence, and so on and so forth, and are uh, participating in different uh, attempts to demonstrate, because I mean, you cannot say demonstrations in Egypt. There are attempts to demonstrate or to do popular march, and sometimes they are by, uh, hindered by the security apparatus. Mu'taz, um, no, I do not see it related to, to the, con uh, I do not see the current dynamism or mobility related to the constitution amendments of 2005 and 2007, for the simple reason that prior to 2005 and 2007, we had um, uh, as I said, uh, a similar wave of um, uh, political dynamism. And when I look at the details of the Constitution amendments, um, most of the amendments are undemocratically spirited. Uh, apart from um, uh, some interesting amendments, um, transferring, sort of replacing the prime minister, uh, replacing the vice president with the prime minister in terms of who takes over when the president is temporarily not incapacitated, but is um, uh, uh, ca cannot perform his job. So no, I do not see it related to that. El joining, el it's a good question. Why, why, why is Al Baradi saying that he will only run as an independent candidate and he will only run uh, on the presidential ballot provided the government amends the constitution to allow for independence to run? And well knowing that um, um, uh, easing restrictions on independence might lead to a, a Muslim Brotherhood candidate as well. Why is he saying no to joining a political party? And he was called on to do that by President Mubarak himself in Germany before, uh, before he went to the hospital and later by different government representatives. I guess for two reasons. One, Al Baradai's calculation was um, uh, to project the image of someone who is interested in significant political reform in Egypt. It's not only about him running, it's about him pushing the country into greater democratization, greater political freedom, and better respect for human rights, uh, better political competition. And this does not go well with the possibility of Dr. Baladi becoming just one candidate of a party. Secondly, uh, which is a good reason, um, uh, we have seen how party candidates uh, were treated in 2005. Uh, Ayman Noor and Nu'man Goma. And this is not the most rosy, I guess you would agree, sort of uh, prospect, which you would <laughs> offer an opposition candidate. Um, I disagree uh, a bit on, uh, on the emergency law. No, it's, it's uh, the emergency, the state of emergency makes it impossible for political parties and political actors to become active. No, you cannot rally. Be it they are arrested according to uh, regular laws or based on the emergency law, I, I do not know it. But the fact of the matter is that if three Egyptians meet in the public space, you can arrest them according to the state of emergency. Uh, yeah, just one comment on the, the stability and stability issue. Uh, we haven't really used the word uh, uh, economy or economics. And, and you know, it, it's true here, it's true in Egypt. It's the economy, stupid. And, and frankly, uh, Egypt is experiencing something like four and a half to five, uh, five and a half percent growth this year. The situation is never good, obviously. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of poverty, uh, rising inequality, but it's not, it's not bad necessarily either. And uh, things really go down the tubes when uh, issues touch on the touch on bread and butter issues, touch on people's pocketbooks, and. Um, there seems to be a lot of infusion of, of, of capital uh, into the economy from the state this year. Don't underestimate the ability of the state uh, 
sort of to prime the pumps pre-election, uh, in this pre-election period, public sector wages were, uh, were just increased. And so I think this is something to watch as well, not just the, the politics of it. We're almost out of time, but I have one question that was handed to me. There are actually people in the outer room uh, listening from out there. And uh, so I think we'll uh, maybe we'll end on this one. This is from Camille Ice, the Truman National Security Project. What can the United States government in the current context do to best demonstrate support for democracy and human rights in the run up to the 2010 and 2011 elections? So I'll ask each of our speakers to comment on that and please also you can add any closing thoughts um, you know regarding the general subject of the elections and then we'll then we'll finish you want to sure wanna go first chairman well the, the role of the United States it's obviously been a, a, a tremendous debate in this town for some time um, clearly the United States is doing something right now with the election there's a technical assistance program to train people so USAID other programs are committing resources uh, in that regard. Now, there are people in this room that want to see a lot more done. Uh, there are people who want to see uh, rhetoric increased and raised and, and heightened and sharpened. Um, there are people who want to see uh, our foreign military assistance conditioned on, on changes in uh, Egyptian behavior on the ground and opening up of space. And there are people in this room that have nothing, don't want anything to do with that. Um, and it's become sort of more polarized over time, and the administration is in a very sensitive position. It's trying to sort of straddle that line, and as I mentioned before, straddle that line in the context uh, where Egypt is playing a very positive role and a very helpful role in our regional peace efforts. And uh, again, I'll just reiterate, I don't envy those in that position to have to sort of walk that line. Okay, um, well, to, to my mind, the U.S. government cannot afford to, um, to be silent about Egypt and its events in 2010, 2011. The political calendar, the cycle which we are looking at, is going to force the administration to address different issues. We saw it a couple of weeks ago, right after the April 6th administration, spokesman of the uh, State Department uh, had to address the arrests which took place. We will see more. Of, of, of those scenes and similar scenes to 2005 and 2010, 2011. So the administration, so silence or uh, continuing to treat uh, Egypt uh, and its politics as a Egyptian politics as a low profile issue is to my mind not an option. You will be forced by the political calendar to address it. Secondly, and, 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 and sort of um, while realizing the significance of what, what Jeremy has just said, there is a room of maneuver for the U.S. administration to address uh, election-related issues primarily. And to my mind, what needs to be done is, A, to focus on the upcoming parliamentary elections. There is no need to address the presidential elections. It's very tough to tackle the demands by al Barad and his group to amend the Constitution to allow for greater space for independence. From a U.S. perspective, this brings in right away the question of what would happen to the possibility of a Muslim Brotherhood candidate and how to tackle that. So realistically, this is not part of what can be said in 2010. What can be said in 2010 is, A, on the extension of the state of emergency, of the emergency law. Here, a firm position, at least a position of sorts, uh, needs to be conveyed. And this is part of what the president promised. And President Obama says that he is going to address issues which the government of Egypt has put forward as potential future reform steps. Here you have one clear promise which is uh, not being realized. So state of emergency A, B, supervision of elections. If we do not have, if we, if we no longer have judicial supervision, what about international monitoring? And well beyond, to my mind, Jeremy, beyond training domestic observers. We have, for the first time, an opposition spectrum in Egypt, formal, informal, religious, uh, secular, which has come to agree on the need of international monitoring. So why, 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 uh, why, why is the U.S. government silent on that? There is no, I mean, I understood the position in 2005 because there was a great disagreement in Egypt whether this is part of what we want or not, and question of sovereignty, and the regime played successfully as a game of sovereignty, and sovereignty is uh, uh, being uh, challenged and so on. So today it's not the case, so, wh so why not? And finally, why not address, once again, the structural conditions of political competition in Egypt approaching 
the parliamentary elections, restrictions on political parties, restrictions on civil society uh, organizations, on NGOs, um, uh, restrictions on, 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 uh, on candidates. So address the structuring conditions of political competition. Doing all three uh, elements of what I have just said does not mean that the U.S. by any means would be endorsing al-Baradai or his demands or any set of actors in Egypt and does not have, in that case, to go into a detailed discussion of which personality who is a preferable actor, opposition or otherwise, to the U.S. Uh, to my mind, this needs to be said. And silence, treating the, manner as, uh, treating the matter as a low-priority issue, gets interpreted in Egypt de facto as a support of the Mubarak regime. Thank you very much, Amr. Uh, I think this is just the opening of a conversation we'll be having over the next year and a half or so. I want to thank Jeremy Sharp and Amr Hamzawi for getting us started, a, a solid start on that conversation, and thank you for participating. <laughs>